good afternoon so today we will discuss mainly about excel diffraction spin shuffle instrumentation and data analysis so first we will look forward to the diffraction so the diffraction is a process by which a beam of light or other system uh, of wave which spread out as a result of you know passing through a narrow aperture you can see here this is a narrow aperture that orange one so if you, when light is passing through through this aperture you can see how the wave nature is you know, generated by due to the diffraction you can see here so, so the wave patterns are generated so typically it's accompanied by interference between wave front produce so um, once it go through a you know small hole so it will be spread out as a result of you know passing through the spin so if you see that this is a single uh, window that passing through the beam you will get you know different diffraction uh, spots and when that that particular you can see here this straight line so here you, see, you will see a clear peak so that indicating that highest intensity is passing through this orifice so depending upon that you will see dark and uh, light spots on the photographic film so similarly if you see the young's double sheet experiment that you, you can see here two uh, slit first one is here and another two is here you can see how these wave fronts are generated and with these wave fronts will be either constructive or destructive interference so that when the d sin theta equal to m lambda that uh, m equal to one two three so when d sin theta m lambda you will get a constructive interference in case of young's double sheet uh, experiment if it's m plus half lambda then you will get a destructive interference so either it will be constructive or it will be destructive so simply if you we'll see a diffracted beam may be defined as a beam composed of large number of scattered rays mutually and, and reinforcing each other if you see here the top image you can see that uh, this is the particle uh, on which you have you know that uh, light is your x-ray beam is getting diffracted you can see the so yeah, scattering will be all possible direction it will, it will be diffracted scattered in all direction so it's uniformly in all direction but but when you go for a diffraction in case of solid or crystal you can see here there are lattice planes that yellow lines that um, there so then you will get a you know uh, mutually reinforced so you can see the one of another the, the whether you, this type of wave pattern will you, you will get it so either it can be constructive or destructive but it is in particular uh, direction you will see this type of you know diffraction uh, things so so simply if you we'll see that in, when there will be a constructive a phase difference between two waves they can see the, there is a black waves and a red waves on the top image where phase difference is zero degree you can see here that both are in same phase then in that case you will get a, a that both maxima lies in one another you can see here that both maxima lies on one another so in here what you will see you will see that constructive interference but when you will go to the, uh, the phase difference theta not equal to zero in this case you can see so they all are you know you know in one direction but you can see that the maxima is a different position here this three position different position so in this case you will get a you know, scattering that uh, they are not in you know particular you will not get a perfect constructive but in some are in you know see uh, constructive in this nature so if you are a wave interacting with a solid you will see scattered beams interfere constructively in some direction that produce that constructive beam will produce you know producing diffraction whereas phase difference you can see here when it's 180 degree you can see the red and blue one that maxima lies you know opposite to each other here it's cancel out so you will get you no know, diffraction beams here so more is mostly it's destructive interference so diffraction occurs when light is scattered by a periodic array with long range order you can when there is a periodic array like all you no know, lattice planes are periodically arranged so if you see here that this type of particular arrangements are there so then that you have will see a diffraction will occur here in this case so if there is a long range ordering only that you will get a diffraction pattern and
Yeah. So if we go to the before going to the X-ray diffraction techniques, so first we will see the how the X-ray diffraction comes into picture. A little bit about history. In 1895, so X-ray was discovered by this scientist study Rontgen, and then so the 1914 the first diffraction pattern of the crystal made by Nipping and von Lau. So the first diffraction pattern was generated in 1914. Then theory to determine the crystal structure from Bragg's law that comes to the picture 1915. Then powder oxide was developed by German and US scientists in 1916 to 17. And first commercial you know, uh, powder oxide, the Philips PW1050. So that comes in 1947. And in 1953, the DNA structure was solved by Watson and Kennedy. This is the mainly that you can see the critical point where X-ray was extensively used then by analyzing single crystal molecules. So if you see here, this is the you know fast X-ray film that produced by Rontgen. Where this is the hand of his wife's finger. You can see here that rings that she has where that rings is comes in this picture. So this is the first X-ray. You know, photographs that's generated by you know diffraction that from the X-ray. So X-ray diffraction is a similar principle to multiple slit, slit experiment, like young slit, double slit experiment. If you keep multiple slits, so the diffraction in you know, X-ray diffraction is similar to that. And when you have a constructive and desktop interface pattern, depends on the lattice spacing that is D, that between you know, the in the, in the solid you have a lot of you know planes. So between two planes that the D spacing. The lattice spacing that uh, determines that whether we are constructive or interference or desktop interference as well as to have length of radiation. That lambda which you choose in, so these two parameters mainly determines the wavelength of X-ray are similar to the distance between atom because see you, you are, we are going to see the atomic structure that whether the phase is formed or the, the crystal is formed or not at the atomic resolution. So that the X-ray's wavelength is equivalent to the distance between you know atoms that uh, this spacing equal more. So that's why X-rays are used to see the crystal structures. So if you see that uh, you, in this we, last class we have discussed how X-rays are produced. You can see here you have a uh, see high voltage that you apply to the cathode element and then uh, that the, the electrons are produced which fall on the tungsten target and to produce X-rays. And once X-rays are produced, you have two types of uh, spectrum. You get one is continuous spectrum, that is Bramstrom radiation, other background radiation, and then you have a sharp peak here. Those are characteristic peaks, lie particularly to the K alpha or K beta lines. And that K alpha, K beta lines are mainly designated the, from which cells that uh, you know, vacant orbital is getting filled by the electron of which cell. So if it is L cell, then it's K alpha. If it is M cell, then it's K beta, and so on. So here you can see one that uh, that X-ray that uh, because of projectile electron that one electron knockout so it create a um, hole so that hole is produced by you know either K alpha that uh, higher orbital electron so in this way so you, you will get an X-ray uh, to be produced so here so then 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 you can see the wavelength of the X-ray radiation so you have a large number of targets like from molybdenum copper copper iron, so chromium you can use and their wavelength, you know, see the wavelength are 0 0.71 angstrom molybdenum and then 1.54 angstrom is about copper. So these are all, you know, atomic distance in like you almost equivalent to D spacing and this respective filters are, you know, filled Z minus one atomic number for molybdenum it is chromium, zirconium for copper is nickel that they are used. So based on that I've discussed. So, so if you see the, the X-ray diffraction, so uh, Atomic planes of a crystal, you know, it causes the incident beam of X-ray to interfere with one another. So if you have a, you have a plane here, this is a atomic plane. On that atomic plane, we have a, when you have an incident beam fall on this, so this this incident beam, what will happen? It interact with the with the interfere with this crystal lattice and it diffracted in a particular you know, angle. So based on the constructive interference of monochromatic X-rays, whatever the X-ray we are using, they are highly monochromatic. So you know, the, the, the fixed almost a you know, fixed wavelength. So that comes because of the constructive interference of the monochromatic X-ray and a crystal material. If you have a crystal and material, you will get a diffraction pattern. But amorphous material, because in case of amorphous material, there is no you know, long range ordering is there. So in that case, you may not get 
no perfect X-ray diffraction peak, instead of you will get a broad spectrum. So, but in case of highly crystalline material, you will get X-ray diffraction. So, it's a non-destructive technique to identify the crystalline phase. Like, so here, the material after X-ray analysis, you can recover and reuse for other purpose. So, here, that is a non-destructive technique. And then, it measures average despacing, lattice parameter, crystal size, phase composition, atomic arrange arrangement, or strain or stress in the system. So, so many things you can um, get from X-ray diffraction analysis, from phase analysis to, you know, how the crystallite size and lattice strain are built in the material. And for unknown structure, you can also find the crystal structure. And the detection limit here is up to 2 to 3 percent. If you are doping, like for example, in zinc oxide doping nickel or cobalt, if doping is more than 2 to 3 percent, then you can easily you know, identify those secondary phases if they are anything. And it can be detected even if you use your high energy, like X ray, like synchrotron X radiation. In that case, up to the detection limit can go up to 0.1%. So here, that wavelength we are choosing the direction diffraction, that should be highly coherent, monochromatic, and it should be parallel waves. So then only you can see when incident beam falls, it's diffracted at an angle 2 theta here, and this 2 theta will measure and you'll be able to get that, which are what are the diffraction that has, has been formed. So if, if, the, if you look into the Bragg's law, so that is the main basis of the X-ray diffraction. So the Bragg's law satisfies that, you know, diffraction occurs only how when Bragg's law is satisfied, that Bragg's law is N lambda equal to 2D sine theta. So, you know, different planes have different D spacing. Therefore, you have to be, you know, Bragg's law has to be satisfied uh, for that, we have D has to be changes. So, so you can see here that that red lines this year that this is the crystal planes are there on the crystal plane. You can see that X-ray one and X-ray two are falling. You can see that they are they're falling here and diffracted in this angle at angle theta. And this this if you see here this this is the uh, that X-ray one and X-ray two that extra path length are covered by the X-ray two is only this much here and this much here. Look at these two, these two, this, and these two, these are the same, and here to here, and here to here is same. So you, this distance and this distance is same, here to here, and here to here is same. So extra, excess part difference is only this distance. So this distance is nothing but this uh, um, d sine theta. If this is the angle theta, then this will be by Pythagoras formula, you can find out this, this distance will be d sine theta. So d sine theta plus again this direction d sine, this, this is 2d sine theta. So that 2d sine theta is here. So 2d sine theta is equal to the integral multiple of, you know, wavelength. So n is the order of reflection and d is displacing. So once n lambda is equal to 2d sine theta is satisfied, so then the fraction occur. So sine theta here, if you see the formula, sine theta can't be more than unity. So n lambda should be always less than 2d for, you know, n equal to 1, and lambda is less than 2d. So your wavelength, you have to choose in such that, you, that it should be less than twice of that of the wavelength, or that the displacing of the particular crystal you want to see. So mainly the path difference must be integral multiple of wavelength to satisfy the Bragg's law. If you see here that Bragg's law, uh, how it's going in, we have seen a case of a reciprocal lattice that n lambda equal to 2d sine theta, you can write here sine theta equal to lambda by 2, from here sine theta equal to lambda by 2 by dh scale. So if you reverse it, so 1 by d you will take this on the top, 1 by d h scale and these two bottom, so then it is a 2 by lambda. So this is this, this is the how sine theta that Bragg's law in case of you know reciprocal lattice that you will see. So for that you have to this 2 by lambda is here, so you have to draw a uh, circle that 2 lambda is your diameter and a 1 by lambda is your radius and a con construct a triangle in such a way that your max that radius will be your uh, hypotenuse uh, and it's 1 by d that is your that uh, this side then you will get uh, a rectangle a triangle with a 90 degree here um, angle then you get AOP is a right angle triangle and then you will see that this this this, this reciprocal lattice say 1 by d they express it d star so d star h scale equal to d h scale by equal to 1 by d h scale this, this sphere is called equal sphere and here that whatever the image 
that the, the diffraction pattern you get in X-ray analysis that is mainly on reciprocal lattice which expressed by uh, 1 by t. So here if you see the Ewald sphere, you can see that um, you have an incident light S0 is falling on the crystal and is diffracted in this direction. And here this is 2 theta and this distance is 1 by dH scale. So this point, if you see here, that particular point here, that I shown that P point I mentioned here. Whenever you have a reciprocal lattice, that point fall on this point, any point uh, on this ring, then you will get able to get a diffraction. So that uh, you can see here. So the diffraction maxima occurs only when you know Bragg's equation is satisfied, and this condition occurs whenever the reciprocal lattice lies on this. Uh, Ewald sphere. So if a B point here and a O origin is here and C point here, whenever that B point that 1001, 101 is meets here in the this this ring, then only you will get a particular you know diffraction. Otherwise, you will not be able to get a diffraction in case of this. So if you see the order of reflection that we see that a 2D sine theta L lambda, so n can be 1 to n we can vary 1, 2, 3 up to n. So if n is equal to 1, then you call it first order, n equal to second order, and so on. So if you see here that if a copper k alpha wavelength we use generally, that copper k alpha wavelength is 1.5405 angstrom, and if you see the despacing of d110 flame, but that is here 2.22 uh, angstrom, you can see here that for n sine theta, is the theta value 20 degree, they will get 110 peak for the wet, you know, uh, sine theta where is 0.34. So here d0 is you can from this d0 will a by square root of 2. That's in a cubic crystal. So d equal to 1 by h square plus k square plus l square. So 1 square plus 1 square here 1 and 1, 2. So a by square root will be d110 plane. But similarly, if you go over a second order peak, so that appears at 43.92. So you can see here, so for a second order peak, if you see that 110 one so this will be 2 to that will be a by square root of 8 which is equivalent to for a 2 to 0 plane of first order so if you put 2 to 2 2 to 0 you will get a by square root of 8 and that 2 to 0 and 110 you can see you see the relation so d 2 to 0 by d 110 is 1 by 2 so that means if you have a nth order reflection of hkl plane the D spacing D may be treated as you know, faster, faster reflection from NH, NK, and NL plane. So HKL plane and your nth order instead of N, since you, you can't count N, so in that case you will take the NH, NK, NL is the you know, faster reflection of that plane. So you'll get D dash to be D by N. So this is the simple relation between first order and multi order peaks. So this Bragg's law is a you know it's a negative statement. That means it's a, if Bragg's equation is not satisfied, there is no reflection occurs. So Bragg's law has to satisfy to get a reflection, but that is not you know uh, it's compulsory. If Bragg's law is satisfied, you may get a reflection, you may get a diffraction pattern. That may not that this Bragg's law satisfied, not necessarily that you will always get a diffraction fix. Thus, even though Bragg's equation satisfies, reflection is not observed. If you see this example, that one here, that VCC structure, that every copper, that with the molybdenum VCC structure here, that is a green plane at the top and bottom, and in between there is a, you know, a red uh, plane. You can see there is a one say, VCC, you have a center atom is there. So if you see the phase difference, that uh, top wave is behaving like this, and bottom is in this phase, or is middle one is in uh, uh, almost, you know, opposite phase. And so that's where the wave scattered from the middle plane is out of phase with one scattered from the top and bottom. So here n lambda is 2d sine theta is not satisfied. So because of that, what will happen that this particular, you know, uh, peak that uh, 100 peak that uh, uh, reflection is absent in VCC structure of molybdenum. So that the, from the, even though here, you know, uh, the, the out because of the out of phase, so this particular will, uh, the reflection you will not able to see. But the faster reflection from two to zero plane is observed since the phase difference is lambda. But one zero zero plane you will not able to see uh, that uh, diffraction peak. But in case of two zero zero, it is 
possible. Similarly, if you see the NaCl and KCl structure, you, there will be a difference in you know, uh, crystal planes to observe. If you see here NaCl and KCl, you can see that, uh, that this is chlorine and uh, sodium and chlorine atoms are periodically arranged, and the structure may be uh, thought to be as two interlocking caps, CCP arrays close cubic closed pack arrays of Na plus and Cl minus ion. And here, the closed pack Cl ion lies parallel to the body diagonal. Here, this is here the body diagonal here. You can see here, that is the halfway between the one one layer. So here you can see, this is the um, halfway between that. And reflection from Cl minus, and that uh, it's exactly out of which that of, you know, here and here that sodium and chlorine, this is the, Sodium and chlorine, they have almost out of phase. Since chlorine, you have a eight electron and it's scattered extreme more than Na plus, which is 10 electron, the reflection will partially cancel in case of one, one, one peak. So here, this is the one, one, one plane. So here you can see that reflection from, you know, uh, Cl and Na, they are slightly different because they are not isoelectronic. So because you one is 18 electron, one is another is 10 electron, so this, you will not able to, you know, you will see a very the weak intensity in case of one 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 plane. But if you go to two 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 plane, that content when you hear two 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 plane, they are very close to each other that plane. So because of that, you will see a strong reflection in case of NaCl. But you go to KCl. In KCl, you see here here your Na atom is quite red one is quite small in comparison to green chlorine atom. But here you see uh, in case of you know. Uh, yeah, in case of KCl, your potassium and chlorine are almost isoelectric. So because of isoelectric, you can see here, in case of KCl, that one one peak is here absent, but in NaCl, you have a little bit, you know, uh, because of there is a not 100% cancel between Na and Cl, they're not isoelectronic, you'll be able to see that peak, but one one peak is absent in this case. So, and because of that, you will see less number of peaks in case of KCl in X-ray diffraction. So, if you will see that um, selection rules where the diffraction can occur and where it will not occur. So, you have seen even if Bragg's equation is satisfied, reflection may go missing. So, this is due to the presence of additional atoms in the unit cell. Like in molybdenum, there is in the BCC, the center atom, in an additional atom, it is, you know, it's not satisfied with the, you know, phase, L, L lambda equal to the sine theta, the Bragg's equation, you are not able to see that peak. For simple cubic, you can see all reflection is possible in case of simple cubic. But, uh, but in case of body center, you will see reflection is mainly possible when H plus K plus L, that is even. But reflection necessarily absent will be when it is odd. For phase center cubic, you will see HKL is unmixed, that is all odd or all even, then only you will be able to see that, uh, that for example, if all odd or all even means it's like uh, three, uh, uh, three, like one, let's say if that you have plane like, I'll show you that plane like here, a one, 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 or two, or two all, 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 all even number, two, two, two. So there you will be able to see in case of, you know, in this year, has center, you will see that reflection. If it's mixed or even mixed, you will not able to see the reflection. So if you see the ratio of A square plus K square plus L square is derived. So that is used, you know, for from this extension rule, for determine, you will determine. So for SC simple cubic, your A square plus K square plus L square will vary like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 8. But in BCC, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and like here it is 7. But similarly, first center, 3, 4, 8, like will HKL, a particular plane that the index value will be R by square. So you'll be able to hear who you can see in the where the that they satisfying. So based on that, you can determine the which type of lattice is. Whether it is simple cubic, BCC, FCC, you can identify. You can see here, or allow reflection for S square plus K square plus L square for one, that is one zero zero plane, two, one one zero plane, and three, one on one plane. So all these satisfy. But in case of FCC, since it's here one one zero plane is not you know, possible because here it has to be all has to be even or all has to be odd, then only you'll be able to see in this case. Uh, so, S square plus K square plus L square value 
based on that you can decide and you are for 7 and a 15 this can't be expressed as a square plus k square plus l square so these planes will not be able to see but all other planes you can able to see easily so if you see the the diffraction method so far what you discussed that what is the minimum requirement for the diffraction to occur and what are the uh, extinction rules which which planes you can able to see and what you are not able to see that we have discussed so now we'll discuss how the diffraction occurs so if you see the diffraction methods so generally three type of diffraction methods are available one is law method and rotating crystal and powder diffraction instrument it's available in in case of law and this wavelength is variable but angle is fixed the theta is fixed here that lambda used to vary here that used mostly in single crystal but rotating crystal, you have a wavelength which a particular wavelength you have to use and in part that angle is variable and that again used for single crystal. But in terms of powder diffraction um, method, so angle wavelength is fixed and your angle is variable and specimen you generally use powder here. So in case of law method, it's a single theta, you mainly use single crystal and use for determining the crystal orientation and quality of the sample. But in rotating crystal, you can do in powder diffraction method, you can able to identify even the unknown crystal structure here and diffraction here useful to determine the lattice parameter with high precision can be obtained by powder diffraction method. You see here the X-rays are, you know, it's this is the hole where the sample is kept here and sample is kept here and x-ray is coming through the, here is a small hole and that hole will fall on this and you will see the diffraction like different direction it can be diffract so based on this if you create you can see if the, in a powder sample the 10 thousands or more than that uh, thousands of you know crystallized variants in different direction so because of this you will get diffraction peak in different angle and what you will see you will see a cone of you know diffraction, diffraction cone you will able to see that is that is called you know the y cone so if you see the linear diffraction pattern is formed as detector scan across the this whole arc and you can see here this is the arc you are able to get here on the film and this is the uh, you will see in all arc you will see here diffract beam you will giving rise to you know uh, diffraction pattern we are able to see. So linear diffraction pattern is formed as the detector scan through the arc and intersect each device cone. So once it's this, this is one device cone, this is another device cone, like this and this is a back, back, back scatter return one that uh, device cone. So we are able to see you know lots of cone can be produced but only a small fraction of crystallized in the sample actually com contribute to the observed you know, crystal structure. So then if you see this is the film that there's hole here and this here, from this you will see diffraction lining are occurring here. So based on this, you can able to find out that whole type of diffraction. So number of crystal lights that contribute to the measured pattern can be increased. But like, like if you spin the sample, you rotate very fast uh, by spinning sample, you know, the number of crystal that contributes to the measured pattern can increase, but that amount scattered x-ray observed can be increased also using you know large area detector and this type of divide type diffraction cones and all these things used in earlier stage but now it's mostly you know it's used to that uh, uh, 2d detectors are used for you know getting better crystal structure you can see here you have incoming uh, that green line coming Oh, X-ray again falls and then it's diffracted in red direction. Then you are able to get you know this type of ring, uh, this type of you know ring pattern on the diffracted beam. And this that this ring from this ring pattern, you can able to find out that uh, which type of you know that k square k square value. You can see here if a ring like this type of form, and this is the arc s one, and this is the arc s two that best cut one. So th two theta is the angle. So here the s one and this is the S2 hole, you can S1, S2, you can see here this distance, arc distance, and then theta is equal to pi into S1 by 2W. W is your, you know, this the whole that semicircle here, that from that you can able to find out that theta value. So once you know the theta by using, you know, Bragg's law, that in this year D equal to the cubic system, D equal to 1 by S square plus S square, S square root of this, and you will able to see that 
here s square plus k square l square is proportional to sin square theta. So if you see that this uh, uh, summation, it will be proportional to sin square theta. So based on that, you can identify which type of crystal structure has been formed in your system. You can see just one example I have shown here. This is, this is the crystal structure data. You can see my S1, that arc length. I have find out from the arc length, I can find out the theta value. So from theta, you can see the sin square theta we get here that uh, one sine square theta you know that sine square theta you can see 0 0.11, 0 0.15 so now you uh, nearest integer you can see they divide that lowest sine square theta value so that 0.11 is here so sine square theta by sine square theta minimum then you'll get one one like this type of value so then you convert it to the nearest integer number like uh, full nearest number one if multiply by three here then you can see this one become three this is 4.08 8.1 10.9 like 12 points so then you can convert to the nearest whole number so you have three four this is eight and this is almost 11 so this way you can convert that s square plus l square plus l square value so as you know if you have s square plus l square plus l square equal to three then is the possibilities of h scale value of one plus one plus one so from this and then you know the sine square theta and this equation for the cubic system lambda by 4 s square by s square into s square plus k square plus l square so you can easily able to find out the lattice parameter a once you have a lattice parameter a you find out you can see that lattice parameter a is constant it's not changing so so once your lattice parameter is a constant that means it's a simple cubic system fcc a equal to b equal to c so you have a crystal structure you can easily identify by this way. So if you have a non-cubic system like hexagonal, tetragonal, orthorhombic, you have to use a little bit complicated equation and but you can easily by using these days available software and all these things are able to identify uh, which type of you know that plane and all these things you can identify easily. Like for example hexagonal cubic system you have to that 4 by 3 into s square plus hk plus k square if hk 0 plane or l square by c y a whole square is 0, 0, 001 plan, 0, 0, l plan. So depending upon that, you can find out which type of you know, crystal structure has been formed in your system. So this is a, a schematic diagram of a powder X-ray diaphragmometer. You can see here, if I, um, this is a um, X-ray tube that is the source of the X-ray and it's a sample stage. On the sample stage here, it is sample is generally kept uh, here and after the x-ray falling on this so it has to cause through different you know slits like the solar solar slit and divergent slit and finally fall on the sample and then it goes through the different slit it will fall in the secondary monochromatic mirror and then it will go to the detector so detector will now scan that uh, that affection and it identify can able to identify the particular thing so major component are that source so then you need a sample and then you need filters to you know separate out to you know that beta lines k beta lines from k alpha then various slits and mirrors and then you need a detectors for that so if you see the powder diffraction instrumental setup then in case of that there is two type of instrument available one is theta two theta type instrument and another is theta theta instrument in theta two theta instrument you know source is fixed and sample rotates at an angle theta and the detector rotates at 2 theta so theta theta you this is the x-ray tube and then you have a sample here and detector here you can see this is theta angle this is 2 theta angle here in theta 2 theta instrument so this source that here the x-ray source will be this will be fixed and the sample this sample will is here which you have to rotate like like either this direction this direction this direction you have to rotate some by rotating sample you can able to you know identify that different diffraction pattern but in case of theta theta instrument so what happened the sample is fixed sometimes what happens if a powder sample is very difficult to rotate and your sample may fall down so it's better to go for a theta theta instrument where sample is fixed and this detect this instrument this source will rotate uh, theta degree and detector related theta degree so source 
and detector both will rotate and in this case of theta theta instrument so powder diffraction mainly use you know this is, this is a focusing circle if you see here is a some this x-ray tube then the sample and detector sample is the, the center and the x-ray tube and detector on the and a survey on the surface of a circle. So this is the on the surface of the focusing circle you can see and this geometry is called Bragg Benteno geometry. So here diffraction vector S is here is always perpendicular to the surface and it bisects the angle between here between incident ray and scattered ray. So user can choose to move sample and detector or detector or source based on your you know uh, some um, uh, your sampling process and which information you want to do cure that you can identify and you can see here the maximum theta is possible here up to you know 90 degrees so beyond that so it's it go the opposite direction is not possible so theoretically it's here but experimentally it's very difficult to go beyond you know 70 to 80 it's very difficult so yeah, up to, other than that x-ray you know source uh, that uh, the X-ray detector is another important parameter. Like different type of detectors are used. Like for example, point detectors, line detectors, and nowadays you are using area detector. In case of point detector, you have a Jigger Muller counter or professional counter, scintillation detector. So th this type of silicon lithium semiconductor detector. So they observe one point of space at a time. So one at one time they will observe only one point. It is slow but compatible with most of the, you know, uh, or all optics. So produce very high resolution data you can able to get since it's point, point, by point, it is scanning each other. But in case of the position sensitive detector or phase array detector, so here you will able to see the most line detector. So observe all photons scattered in angle. Like in case of here, since a line detector from two to very low angle, you can able to see that scattering. But similarly, in, in case of 2D array or you know CCD plate or imaging plate in the photographic film, you could able to see, you know, you said there are 2D detectors, observe all photons scattered along in a conical sec conic section so you are able to see all photons in case of you know this area detectors so mostly because of that you know small angle x-ray scattering so we use generally line or you know area detectors you can see here in case of a professional counter your x-rays are falling coming here then you have a chamber where cathode is top and anode is the center you can see here and then this is filled with argon krypton or generally some inorganic gases inside that with so that the X-ray is produced here, then it is simultaneously what will happen that it, it will be there in the anode, it will you know, generate the signal. So that signal you can able to detect. So counts all photons within the energy window that heat them and it's a very, very high counting rate and very good resolution you can able to see here. Mostly this is the, if you see the applied uh, amplification factor and voltage, mostly proportional counter here in this region we use you know that because of that is the wire there will maximum number of you know uh, that uh, that x-ray will produce some sort of uh, optical signal or electronic signal so that you can detect here so if you see the scintillator detector you can see here so this is the x-ray is falling here on the light filling so after you know x-ray diffracted from the sample it will fall here uh, then the this there is a sodium iodide lithium crystal and then on the sodium crystal it will body on the light is there so it produces some electrons so then that electron will fall in another dinodes there are multiple dinodes are there here you can see this is one this is two this is three four five dinodes are there so once electron fall here it will amplify the signal intensity it will be amplified and it will achieve to twice double in each case so what you will see, you will able to see my maximum number of, you know, in flex uh, like, uh, die this like, electron that passing through this and you will able to amplify the signal intensity by using this type of EMT tube. So here, you are able to get in very high resolution in that case. So, so if you see that after that uh, instrumentation part, so if you go for the diffraction pattern, so you will mainly you will see mainly three different types of diffraction. One is you can see the without any peak, it's monotonically decreases. The bottom one, and then you have a uh, broad peak here at low angle, or then you have a you know sharp peaks are available here, the top one. So mainly you, depending upon the sample characteristic, you'll able to see different type of 
प्रतिष्ठा स्थल की हो हाईली मोनो मोनोआटमिक गैस यूल की कंटिन्यूस टीके एक्सरे पेटर पर्टिकुलर लिक्विड राउंड और पर्स विभिन्न तो दे डोंट हैव ए लॉन्ग रेंज ऑर्डर बट दे हैव ए शॉर्ट रेंज ऑर्डरिंग इट्स पॉसिबल सो बिकॉज ऑफ शॉर्ट रेंज ऑर्डरिंग यू विल सी ए ब्रोड पैटर्न एट लो एंगल फॉर एग्जांपल इज ऑफ सिलिका सी यू विल एबल टू सी दैट इन अमर पर सिलिका एट अराउंड 27 28 यू विल सी दिस ब्रोड स्पेक्ट्रा बट इन केस ऑफ सिंगल केन केस क्रिस्टल और हाईली क्रिस्टलाइन मटेरियल एबल टू सी दिस टाइप ऑफ पीक सो कैन सी इफ अ सॉलिड सैंपल यू कैन इजीली असेंबल यू नो एक्सरे बीम हियर ऑन द साइड एंड यू गेट द analysis down but in case of liquid sample it is you know it's a here in case of there is a transmission method is used instead of reflection you can see your x-ray is transmitting the this sample and falling on the falling on the detector even you can use inverted x-ray like in case of liquid sample you have a liquid here you can put liquid here then x-ray can fall from the pattern and it can go like this in say inverted x-ray you can also use uh, For liquid samples, so if you see that since that is, I told there is a two types. You have a single crystal and a polycrystal material. In this case of single crystal, you will see you know uh, peak of same order peaks are you know mul multiplication of that same order peak, but in terms of high non this powder sample, uh, powder sample you will able to see multiple planes. For a single crystal, you can see here all planes are real space. All planes are lies like in one direction parallel to each other, and then um, there is one orientation in real space resulting. Since all are oriented in one direction, you will see here in case of reciprocal lattice, all are oriented again in one direction. So reciprocal lattice points are resolved and will result in diffraction intensity when they touch the UL sphere. I told this response. This point, this particular point, will touch on the UL sphere. So then we will able to get the diffraction. So rotating crystal rotates the reciprocal lattice. But in case of you see, this is the real space. This is the reciprocal space here. You can see that uh, they are rotated to other direction. This angle. So that is mainly the rotating crystal rotates the reciprocal lattice. It rotates. But here, if you see the diffraction one in a single crystal, the incident beam is coming and it is diffracting in one direction. Then you'll able to see this type of spot patterns. You'll able to you'll get familiar orientation from the single crystal. That that means that you can see here is a single crystal that takes spectra that is using Bragg Benton geometry. So you can see that two theta you have peak here uh, and you have a peak here. So one zero zero and two two zero is highly you know see this these are highly you know ordering structure and from this plane one zero zero plane. There is there is possibility of diffraction, but one one zero plane you can see this is tilted plane. From this plane is you can't use one this X-ray diffraction. That is single that single crystal is in that sense peak is here absent. So you see there is no peak here here and here. You will not see any peak, but you will see a two theta um, with the one zero zero and two two zero. There was only that high one zero zero and two two zero is the higher order plane of this. So those type of you know one Zero zero two zero zero four zero zero six zero zero like this type of you know symmetric that ordered plane so higher order plane you can able to observe. But in case of polycrystalline material, you can see here this is the uh, in the sample there is different crystal oriented in different direction. So if you have a blue line, you see that diffract in one direction. When it falls on black line, that diff may diffract in other direction. So depending upon that, what will happen? You will get multiple you know diffraction spot. So for this for this particular plane, from one some one plane you will getting this, another plane you are getting this, another plane you are getting this, and so on. Since in polycrystal line, so diffraction occur in different you know uh, planes. So you are able to see you know spotty pattern, this type of spotty pattern. But here in case of, you can see here if uh, this uh, this is the blue one here only one one zero zero plane. So that peak is also observed one one zero. If you tilt it in other direction, so there is another plane. That plane now satisfy Bragg's law. So you are able to getting that one zero zero peaks. So all possible diffraction peaks should be observed as a polycrystal and sample contains many crystallites. For every set of plane, there will be a small percentage of crystallites that are properly oriented and are too different. So fully a sample may not you know you not able to get that diffraction pattern only as There's a small percentage of crystallites that are properly oriented to the diffraction. That only show the 
diffracted, that only diffract the beam. So basic assumption of powder diffraction are that of every set of lens, there is equal number of crystallites and that is, that will diffract and that there is a statistically relevant crystals, not just one or two. So a multiple number of crystal lies in the polycrystal material and then you will able to see that point, you know, multiple peaks. You can see here, this is a zinc oxide structure. You can see it exists in multiple phase. At, there is a zinc band flare, there is a oogite phase, and there is a nano tetrapod at, you know, smaller size, particle size, you know, the dark national patterns. You see both zinc blend and oogite, they have different crystal structure. So the zinc oogite structure, you can see external arrangement, but here you can see the zinc blend ZNO are origin some other structure. So this type of phases, even though they have uh, same zinc, zinc oxide exist in two different phases, so that can be identified easily by using X-ray diffraction method. So crystal structure describes the atomic arrangement of the material which is done, and the, the, the atomic the crystal structure mainly describes the atomic arrangement of the material where the atoms are arranged differently in a different direction to produce you know multiple you know, planes. But if you go to the nano, in that of nano, there is a small size because of no small size, you can able to see the broad, you know, X-ray peaks you can able to see here. So why these are broad and all these things we'll dis discuss with later. So this is the mainly three different, different type of, you know, diffraction pattern that you can able to identify the which phase is formed. So I have just shown just an example how you identify from a crystal uh, pattern and which type of uh, crystal from a diffraction pattern how you can identify the particular crystal structure that you can identify. Here I have shown that, uh, that using the position that uh, the two theta value where that uh, peaks are existing so that you have to identify it and then the particular two theta value what is the intensity so this is maximum intensity peak is around somewhere 32 and second intensity is somewhere 45 then you want to identify two parameters you have to remember one is relative intensity another is the position and then you have to match this with the experimental data to the available database from the JCPDS or ICDD International Committee of Diffraction Data or Joint Committee for Powder Diffraction you know, spectrum. So you have to see that in database you can identify those peaks. So you can, from the database you will see this type of data will be available there. So in that the JCPDS or ICCD data. And then you have to identify which plane strongest peaks. So what is the first three strongest peaks? So you can see here that the peak at 31 and 60 and this, this or these two, they are most fast three, you know, the strongest peaks. So the D spacing 2.82, 1.99, 1.63 are the, you know, strongest points. Once you know that from the JCPDS manual, you can find out that in the plus or minus this, this 2.82, so you can identify with the 2.84 to 2.80 D spacing. Once that's identified, you go to the, you know, you will with D spacing, 2.82 from the CPDS data, I have found that uh, it's about 17 elements are there that have uh, out of 17 elements is there that is having nearly similar D2. What only have D1 is 2.82 and D2 is also 1.99 in all this case. So then you have to go for the next intense peak that the third one that's 1.63. So that we found among these only NACL we are able to see here that is 1.63 you know that uh, D spacing is exist. So because then you can out of this only NACL D3 is similar. So this crystal structure is a NACL. So similarly you can identify on uh, most of the known structure from the JCPDS. If you are unknown structure then you have to go for that uh, lattice parameter calculation by using root tool analysis and other refinement parameter you can able to identify what type of crystal structure is formed. So, so here that you can see from the, the after the analysis of the page, so next thing is your, since the peak you are getting at this type of peak, uh, we'll discuss about, uh, you, you identified the crystal structure now, so which particular crystal has been formed, the next step to see what the other information you can get from XRD. If you have a um, diffraction pattern, you see 
that is this type of diffraction pattern if your intensity here and two theta here and this type of peak you are able to get in. So here you can see this is instead of a sharp delta function, you are getting little broad peak. So this from this broadness that you, uh, you are able to get some you know information. So that is that that B instrumental like every instrument has some you know line broadening. So that factor that due to mainly alpha one, alpha two, k alpha one, k alpha two, or in perfect focusing of the sample or non monochromatic the source that instrumental factor B i uh, broadening that is one factor. And another thing is crystal size that the, how the crystal size that uh, if the smaller size that uh, you know the no bracts the may not be completely satisfied so there will be in the vicinity of theta b there's a negative bracts the equation is not being satisfied we'll get the crystal size bc and then if, they, if there is a lattice strain so the residual strain arising from the like some of dislocation defects inhomogeneity of composition solid solution allowing you'll able to get strain also there is stacking fault like atomic arrangement there is some mis misplacement of atom you'll able to get that stacking fault in the burning due to stacking fault and there is no other things are there. So what is that the FWHM will get full width half maxima so that will be summation of all these parameters. If you see here, this is the diffraction beam here, this is the full width half maxima at the maximum high full width at half of the this total height is here and half is here, here at particular half um, maxima you will see the full width you are able to see that is FWHM that is the summation of all these parameters like uh, instrumental broadening, crystal size broadening, then you know strain, all these things will come into picture. Where in case of you a sharp peak in a bulk, you may be able to get this type of sharp peak, but in case of nano, that is strain and crystallite size will come into picture, you will get mostly this broad peak. So once you have got a broad peak, the next thing is to I into you know before going for the calculation of your crystallite size or for the you know strain you have to instrumental line broadening has to be subtracted so you have to see whether the instrument is following lorentzian or gaussian function if it's lorentzian function then you have to use b broadening minus the sample minus b of the that is the i the b i either from the instrumental broadening you have to subtract that directly you have to subtract here but you have a Gaussian line, then you have to, you know, square of that, you have to put B square minus B I square, you have to use broadening due to the, you know, that what you are getting and the instrumental broadening in that B I square, you have to minus how you minus. So for that, before doing your X-ray analysis, you have to do a sing, single crystal silicon, you have to uh, run for X-ray analysis in single crystal X-ray that generally gives a 27, 28, you will get a sharp peak. So if there is no instrumental broadening, the single crystal, if you take a silicon 1111 uh, plane, so you will get a sharp peak at here. So in, if there is any broadening uh, in this peak, so that is mainly due to the instrumentation broadening and that broadening has to subtract it by using this equation. If it's following a geometric mean, then you have to use this equation. So based on your instrument, instrument, you have to use, you have to subtract first that uh, instrumental line broadening, then also some experimental error that comes into picture that you have to see the sample, you know, properly placed on the sample holder. Sometimes that the technician do a mistake that whether the sample is placed here or sample is here is here, but instead of your your X-ray is focusing here at this point. In this point is X-ray focusing, but sample position is here. So you have to see whether some that X-ray is properly focusing to the sample. So there you will they'll do that there may be some you know error may be uh, occur because of this you know sampling and also in that it, because of you know despacing is mainly error occurs at low angle theta value if you see here so if you differentiate this d equal to lambda by 2 sin theta you will get d by d you will get minus cos theta by sin theta nothing but minus d theta by tan theta so if you're despacing error d by d error that is mismatching in the lattice so that will you can see here that 1 by tan theta cot theta if you plot cot theta versus theta you here see that cot theta is quite high and here is low so when you go for the um, this uh, crystallite size and all this calculation better to prefer little higher angle peak you got a low angle peak your error is quite high 
then you all, all these errors has to be taken care and then only you will able to get information from the pre -coding. So you'll get two information. First information you'll get about, you know, crystallite size and then is uh, this strain. So crystallite size you can calculate using, you know, Scherer formula that is uh, that broadening the thickness D or B equal to K lambda by beta cos theta or L cos theta, L is nothing but, you know, your L is crystallite size, B is your broadening. So here you can see that this Scherer formula is based on, you know, K is 0.94. Uh, you have to take and here the accuracy is only 10 percent it's mainly because that uh, Scherer formula only satisfied you know whenever particle size is small and that too is considered as a spherical a spherical particles assuming that you, you will get what l value is k value is used here so there are a lot of you know um, the error in this case so you have accuracy of this method is only 10 percent okay? but if the micro strain you can calculate by four epsilon tan theta epsilon is nothing but your strain here and if you see that these two equations that if the WHM you plot with the diffraction angle then beta crystallize and beta strain and both you can see here smaller angle should be used due to separate you can see the B crystalline varies like this whereas B strain is varying like this WHM you see and here at higher angle that broadening is less so here they have separation is quite high so you always you know smaller angle picks uh, that separate you know crystallite size as well as you know strain so that can separate but again you have a problem that you you have if you go to the angle below 20 degree or something that peaks there is a chances of you know d theta error so that uh, above 32 you know 50 up to even 70 that you are up to 2 theta value so in this region you are able to identify the particle size effect and crystal size effect so in addition to that so you can use another equation to calculate you know crystallite size and strain more accuracy by using williamson hall plot so that is equal to that v strain equal to c epsilon tan theta and two crystal k lambda by l cos theta by using this equation if you want beta cos theta equal to this parameter and beta cos theta versus sin theta if you plot on the slope you will able to calculate that strain for the intercept you will calculate the particle size so using these two formula you can you can calculate crystallite size but mumilson hall plot is more accuracy in comparison to the this Scherer formula you can see here you have a in the bulk you will be able to see this type of sharp peak is here but have a nano form that uh, seria nano seria you can see how broad broadening is there so this broadening main is due to either crystallite size and lattice strain and that you can identify in addition to this there are other factors that contribute to the strain are you know dislocation or faults there is a, it's ideal crystal so here you will diffraction pattern will follow like this but here you can see there is a lot of different dislocation here this plane is here and one additional plane is falling here so in this case so your your diffraction you know you will get lots of you know is strain in the system and then that strain because of the additional plane insertion and that strain will be also broadened to the peak profiling and also there is a non-uniform lattice distortion and temperature effect or solution solution inversion it like you have a 10 percent limit is there like if you are doping something like for copper you doping zinc oxide and copper solution solution limit is up to 10 percent and beyond that it may create some strain and those type of um, information in perfect structure would also you know give to the micro strain so if you see that the micro strain here is a d0 they're all are same equidistance d0 here no strain you will get a symmetric peak if, if you were difference d1 is greater than d0 here and the, the, this and this and then you can say that the strain is in shifted peak in non uniform state you will able to get here instead here but if I have uh, uh, it's uniform but it's peak is shifting toward the left and if I have a, this type of cost type of structure and uniform lattice strain is here then you can make the, the, the diffraction peak will broaden and non-uniform strain will be here and then um, you can see that a lot of you know summation of all this will get if crystallite the crystallographic plane has a distribution of this space then your border diffraction peak will be observed for example here I have shown in a solid solution limit that 
you can see this is cerium oxide that you can see the cerium oxide is blue peak you are getting in case of zirconia oxide you will get this red peak when you go for a, a you know cerium zirconia dark cerium oxide so you see cerium c x z r one minus x so here you can see this in, in this case that the, by varying the percentage of x you will able to see this black curve so that is mainly due to inhomogeneity in the solid solution you will be able to get this type of growth structures so then once you have a uh, you analyze your crystal plane how the crystal structure is informed and what is the crystal structure and then uh, phase is identified and you now you have, then you find out that uh, what is the effect of you know, strain and particle size uh, along with this you can also able to get another information from the intensity so the, from the intensity you can able to identify oh, some other information that we will discuss now. So, if you see the intensity of the scattered beam that exceeds is scattering by a crystal can be understood in three steps. So, in a, in, a, in a system or in a cubic system or in any crystal structure, it's composed of a lot of unit cell. So, in that unit cell, you have atoms, and in that atoms, you have a lot of electrons. So, you have a scattering from unit cell, you have a scattering from atoms, and you have a scattering from electrons. So, all these things can be come into picture, and some of these things will contribute to the intensity that you observe. So, in case of electron, you will get a polarization factor. In case of atom, you will get atomic scattering factor, also called form factor. And then, from unit cell, you will get summation of a scattering factor that is called structure factor. So, intensity of diffraction peak are determined by arrangement of atom in the crystal. So, if you have a BCC, FCC or SCP, your crystal arrangement is different. So, depending upon that, your peak intensity Peak diffraction peaks are different and intensities are different. If you see the both atomic structure factor and mm, your, yeah, if you can look into the atom, this, uh, yeah, yeah, if you look into the electron and atom, so both will come for. Uh, both will give to th this this type of scattering that i equal to i zero by r square into this by one by cos one plus cos this is polarization factor and this is that electronic component the electronic uh, that scattering and then you will get uh, this the summation of intensity will be these two parameter so f here that scattering factor depends on number of electrons in the atom j and angle of scattering that is sin theta by lambda if you plot sin theta by lambda versus f so that is your you know uh, scattering factor from the art electron so you can see here the x-ray is coming here and this is x-ray and this scattering in different direction and then the sum of the scat atomic scattering factor you the amplitude of wave scattered by one atom by amplitude of wave scattered by an electron so that f you will able to find out and that f you will vary sin theta by lambda you can see for different atom it's it varies and at higher angle higher theta is decreasing so because of this that's because of the scattering factor you know sin theta by lambda decreases at higher angle if you see that any extra diffraction peak a low angle peaks are high intense and you will go for higher angle peak so they are they are you know smooth small intense so because of this you know scattering factor that if you have a um, higher angle your scattering parameter that sin theta by lambda is smaller so because of that the intensity is you know less at a high angle peaks so you, you, once you have got the that atomic structure at factor then you can get the uh, structure factor of the whole and uh, this uh, this uh, is that from that unit cell, so that scattering factor from the unit cell, so that will be summation of F HKL equal to summation of Fn, that electronic factor from that one particular atom, and then structural parameter e to the power 2 pi i hx into k y n l z. When the atomic position, you will able to get that sum that structure factor equal summation of all you know electronic and atomic structure atomic scattering factor. So f h k l is sum of the resulting scattering from all atoms in a unit cell to from a diffraction fix. And it is independent of the shape and size of the unit cell, but it depends on the position of the atom or ion within the cell. So, the position of the atoms 
define that you know how much the scattering occurs in that so because of that you will get that form factors or structure factor is different it's not depend upon the you no know, shape and size so if you will calculate the electron distribution then electron density distribution rho that is 1 by v of this uh, summation of the, stru the structure factor you will able to find out that you know uh, this electron density which uh, for your transform the structure factor when able to find out the electron density so from the unit cell if you see that a uh, structure factor that amplitude of waves scattered by all atoms in a unit cell divided by at the at amplitude of waves scattered by one electron so if you summation of the all you are able to find out the structure factor you can just one example i have taken here if you see the simple cubic structure that atoms are at 0 0 0 here position this is all 0 0 0 that's called the position atoms here mm, and, and or 0 position or equivalent position like 0 0 1 0 0 1 0 1 0 or this type of equivalent position then you can write f equal to f of j i phi j so if you do this equation and you have position that k x value you will put here then you get f to the power 0 so structure factor is proportional to f that f square is equal to f so f is independent of the scattering plane so if you are hkl independent only that uh, sum of that uh, structure factor will sum of that atomic structure uh, scattering factor here so all these these are the some uh, parameters that you used for calculating this and if you have f6 structure you can see so there is two things occur that atoms are at 0 0 plane 0 0 0 half half 0 or equivalent position you can see here half half 0 or half 0 half or 0 half half position where atom are at the, at the corner as well as you know all face uh, center of the face uh, here in the two systems are going to hkl you know unmixed or hkl mixed that in case unmixed is going to 4f and here f mixed is f equal to 0 and from this plane it is mixed h scale is unmixed and here h scale is mixed then from that you can able to find out what is the structure factor you can able to find out here if it's unmixed is 16 f square if it's mixed then its structure factor is 0 so you will able to, able to find out from the structure factor so in the earlier i discussed why nacl has more peaks than kcl there i told that you know isoelectric thing that how that a k potassium and chlorine isoelectric and because of that that scattering factor that we will calculate the structure factor f if we have four that in case of your nacl you will here you will your f f na plus four fcl and if it's all even and all odd is this must subtract in case of nacl since these are isoelectronic this term will be and they are not isolating so they will get a remaining balance one in kind of kcl for the here is k and cl isolating so they will cancel each other so this this will get zero so because of this zero that particular plane that one 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 uh, peak which you are observing here in nacl in kcl it is absent but in case of newton diffraction you will able to see these peaks so that we will discuss when we will go for newton diffraction so um, from uh, the intensity what parameter you are getting so you are able to getting a structure factor from the unit cell and then in addition you can also cal you can calculate that uh, you know multiplicity factor polarization factor Lorentz factor you know we, we, some of all this for term you will get intensity of the diffraction peak so from this equation that intensity of diffraction peak and if you go for a you know um, analysis of that uh, mixed phase analysis that i will discuss so how you can identify from the intensity as different phases are there if you see here that the, there is a mm, two mixture of phase here that you can see this is the glass this is crystallite and this is quartz. If you have a mixture of all these three, you will get this type of you know spectra. Where is a glass phase is broad spectra you are getting, then a peak from the crystallite and quartz you are getting. Then you can identify contribution of each of these phase by analyzing their phase intensity, that peak in intensity that I discussed. So if you make another example in L2 or 3 TiO23, I have given here, you can see there is a mix component of here so the from xrd pattern we can find out the crystalline phase that is mixed in the structure and how much percentage of that crystalline phase how much armor force that can be determined if you have a mixture of phase by using that phase the whole phase analysis or quantitative analysis so here the intensity of like two two parameter are there in k alpha x alpha and x beta here two phase are there so with high quality of data we can quantify each phase and 
which it must meet the constant volume relation like intensity. This ratio is proportional to that. You can see here the ratio of the peak intensity varies really as a function of weight fraction of two phase. If we, I alpha by I beta two phase, so that is proportional to each constituent like weight fraction of individual. And then by using that reference intensity, if we have a reference standard with the reference using, uh, you can able to identify uh, that which component is but how much that can find, or you can use a rootable refinement or fitting parameter like you know, that you can rootable scale factor with the mass of mass and unit volume of that particular alpha component and sum of the total component. If you're able to find out, then you can identify the each phase. So by using rootable analysis and refinement method that you can use the fundamental calculation from a crystal structure model. So here, what will happen that you have a, a, a particular crystal structure you have to identify that uh, that uh, diffraction pattern you go for a you know it will refinement in that it will environment what you do it's a least, least square method that based on the minimization of algorithm to obtain best fit like if you have a structure here peaks are there so by, by using iteration method you have identify which is the best Peak position that is, you know, identified that. Then starting model, you have to re, you have to choose a starting model where the, the particular crystal system you have to take, whether it's a FCC, BCC, or a CP that you have to choose. And then peak position and intensity constraints should be given. And you can able to all crystallite size, micro strain, for orientation can be extracted from that formula here. Uh, in this, if you see here that this is the rootable formula, you have a you know scaling factor SF, you have a multiplication for multiplicity factor MK, and PK is a preferred orientation, F square is your structure factors, and phi you know, K of 2 theta uh, minus 2 theta K that is your um, this phi K peak profile position, and YBI is the observed background position that intensity from the background intensity. So considering all these parameters, you can identify like if first you have to go for a, you know, you have to choose a select a suitable crystal structure. And in that crystal structure, you have to give unit parameter, I mean, unit cells dimensions, and then full data set once you get the all unit cell alpha, beta, a thick angle value, and then you will able to find out the brackish lattice and space groove, and finally you will be able to get a structure refinement. And this structure refinement here, you can see here, this is the structure refinement of a particular lithium magnesium borate that you can see here. This is the, the, the black one is the, you know, the raw data that you observed why calculate the black is Y calculated, Y observed is red one here, and then black's position is the real position that uh, you know, JCPDS data, and then you can fitting parameter, you can see the how accuracy is fitted, and then uh, you can able to find out that all these parameters like unit cell parameter, A, B, C, as well as, you know, that uh, density, volume, refinement, everything parameter you can able to get. So here, for that you have to, you know, structural variable, you have to take atomic position, fraction of their occupancies, and profile parameter like peak shape, including width, symmetry, or correction terms like absorption, surface roughness, orientation, those things has to be taken care to all this type of analysis. Then, first you determine the absolute structure from the powder data, actually impossible due to, you know, overlap of HKL and minus H minus k minus l value in case of single crystal it's highly possible but in case of powder since there will be overlap of you know it's, it's very difficult but for limited data uh, the constraint and restraint can be necessary like bond length bond angle and composition those are parameter required for full analysis and method only works if you have a good starting model if you're not able to choose a proper starting model you will not able to you know calculate that particular um, crystal structure. So, so far what we discussed today that uh, um, from the X-ray diffraction analysis that uh, we want, you have a X-ray diffraction pattern, from that diffraction pattern, you can able to get different, you know, features. The first, like you can identify the phase, which type of phase is formed, formed whether it is a, you know, um, you are able to get a single phase structure, whether you are able to get a mixed phase. So those type of phase, uh, phase you can identify it. And then whether it's a composition or an abundance, what up to what percentage is, is present. And then if it's a 
composition me like whether it is a zinc oxide and F3O4 or cobalt oxide. So those particular phase you can identify from the X-ray diffraction analysis. And then once you have a, identified that particular phase is formed, you can find out whether it's a it's crystal structure, whether it's FCC, BCC, SCB, or diamond cubic, those type of crystal structure you can easily identify. It. And then from the crystal structure, like you can find out, find out the lattice parameter, A, B, and C, that lattice parameter you can able to identify. And then from the lattice, from the peak in this broadening, from the peak broadening, you can able to find out that crystallite size that like using either the Serer formula or Williamson Hall plot that the Williamson plot is more accuracy will give better crystallite size and micro strain that can be also find out and if if you have a preferred orientation like structure analysis that can also be possible uh, by using X-ray uh, diffraction peaks that you can able to see if you oriented in one direction that particular like for example if zinc oxide grown in 002 plane so you able to see that 002 plane sharp peak in that that particular plane other than you're not able to see other planes here yeah? that, uh, that that proper orientation or epitaxial growth that, that information you can able to find out in addition you can also find out that uh, information about you know in the xrd can be possible to do at high temperature like you have a system that undergo phase transition you know temperature dependent or pressure dependent phase transition so then able to you know now there is a high temperature xrds are available where you can in situ you can vary the temperature and by and then you can at each temperature how that different phases are growing so that structure can be identified even at different pressure this can be possible so so mainly three information the thing that from peak position peak intensity and peak shape and width so whatever that this peak you are getting so here you have a peak particular position that is two theta value so that position is one thing second thing how intense is that particular peak and third is peak shape and what are you see how sharp is this and what is the you know which is this so from these three parameters you can able to get all this information that from peak position it tells about the translational symmetry name what is the size and shape of the unit cell so shape and size information of the about the unit cell you will able to get from the um, peak position but from the peak intensity whatever the peak intensity you are getting here so the peak intensity will give about get the electron density inside the unit cell that structure factor that i, I told that uh, or, you know scattering factor from that scattering factor you will able to uh, get that you know intensity um, that uh, electron density from the, the from the electron density if you you will able to see here you can see from this uh, Yeah, from this, uh, uh, using this uh, electron density, the summation of structure factor, so from that FH scale value, you can able to find out the electron density. Once you have the electron density distribution, and from that uh, the electron distri density distribution, you can able to find out uh, that uh, unit cell, what is the protein inside, what is the uh, atoms are located, where the atoms are exactly located, that can be identified from the peak intensity and then the peak shape and width. So from that you will get whether it is a perfect crystal is formed or not and whether the, what is the, um, that crystallite size, micro strain, so those parameters you can easily able to find out from the peak, inten peak you know, uh, shape and uh, information but for getting that peak information that shape and width you have to consider that the instrumental fact error factor as well as that you know uh, error in d, d small angle lower angle d value you have to consider and you can able to find out that you know peak symmetry and all these things and so um, so mostly the whatever that i thought about uh, this uh, uh, x-ray diffraction analysis you'll able to get these three books that solicited uh, uh, chemistry and its application by A.R. West, that is one book, and for advanced technique by material characterization by Dr. A.K. Tyagi, M. Roy, Kulshrest, and Banachi from that books. Or you can see the BD quality elements of X-ray diffraction or material characterization by Y. Lang. So this, these two books you can are easily available online. So you can able to see in the online that books, most of the even for future class which are which are other techniques. So, so all, all these, you know books you can refer
uh, for details you know understanding of this subject so if any if there is any questions so you can raise now Okay, since there is no question, so we'll conclude today's lecture here. So next lecture, we'll study about that uh, other X-ray techniques like single crystal XRD, thin film XRD, and synchrotron XRD, and a little bit about Newton diffractions. Good.